Well, amen. amen. You guys will remember a couple weeks ago, uh, Pastor Larry Arendis was here. And he tasked me with something. And I don't know if you guys remember, but he presented the first ever Cal Award, the Cal or Carol Arendis Legacy Award. And he presented that to Christine. Christine, would you come on up? I don't know if you remember or not, but he tasked me with, um, he tasked me with um, coming up with nominees for the next Cala Award. And the next Cala Award was to be presented as close to Carol's birthday as possible. And so last Sunday was actually Carol's uh, birthday, December, excuse me, November 7th. And one of the things that he asked me to do, or asked us to do as a leadership, is to find and encourage those who walk in that same vein that Carol did. And I said, well, Larry, what are the criteria for the Cala Award? What, what, is, what, are, you, what are you looking for? How do, I, how do we base a decision on this? And he says, obviously, one, they're a Christian. They've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Number two, they've accepted, not only accepted the Lord, but they've been baptized. They've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they walk in the gifts of the Spirit. They've been prayed for for uh, discernment, that they would have discernment. All those things that Carol exemplified in her life to encourage those who, who are stepping out those. And, you know, in the back of my mind, Lord, I don't want this to be a envy, jealousy, all this kind of thing. But there is some element of truth to encouraging those who are walking in that gifting and encouraging those who say, you know what, I want to be like that too. I want to be eligible for the Cala Award. And so, you know, the last element that he, that he added in there is not only these things, the foundational things of being a Christian, but showed love to one another, reached out to one another, prayed for one another, and used the giftings that they um, had in them, not only just to be a spirit-filled Christian, but to be a spirit-led Christian. And so this morning we present the Cala Award, and I'm going to ask the reigning Miss Cala Award <laughs> to present it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, um, Wayne and I, we prayed, well, we prayed separately first, and um, the Lord showed us someone separately, but the same person. And so, we figured, this has got to be confirmation. And then, um, we were talking to uh, Pastor Larry Orendis without acknowledging who this person was. And he had mentioned this person as well. So we knew, like we knew this was God. So I'm going to ask this person to come up and then I'm just going to say a few words. Kathy Bowles. Miss Kathy Bowles. First of all, um, I know uh, what Larry Arendis had said, uh, what Carol had said about Kathy was Carol would always ask Kathy to pray because she knew she would come willingly and say, whatever you need. And uh, Kathy, I know and we know that we can always count on you. We can always count on you for um, serving in our church, for loving the people in our church, um, always praying, giving us discernment about uh, what you think the Lord is saying in your prayer time and for this church. And we're so grateful that you say yes. There's never a hesitation in you to say, oh, I, don't, I don't think so, I don't think I can do that. It's always <laughs> yes, <laughs> what, what can I do? <laughs> and it's just evident. It's evident in your walk. 
<coughs> it's evident in how you love people. I see how you love, and I see how you reach out. You are always reaching out to others, and we're just so blessed. We're blessed by you, and we're blessed by your yes and obedience to Jesus. Amen. 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 see what she does behind the scenes. You don't. I sit with her at prayer meeting every Thursday night, and I see what God is doing in her life. And Kathy, you're on track. You know? And so Pastor Larry asked, hey, can you videotape this for me? Because I want to see it. And so uh, I'll send this down to him. Guys, I'm sorry. You're not eligible for a Carol Horrendous Legacy Award. But we'll have to start a uh, Legacy Award for the guys to encourage you. But um, Kathy, well done. Well done. Amen. Amen. And so, listen, next year, Christine and I are not doing this by ourselves. We're going to have a committee because this is way oh. too hard. And so um, uh, we kind of did it by ourselves because it was short notice. But, um, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to, to continuing this legacy and uh, this blessing from Spirit and Truth Ministry. So, amen. Mm -hmm. Right? You can get stuff to stop. Tim's going to bless us with the word this morning. Come on up, Tim. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good, morning. good morning. It's just a beautiful way to honor Larry's wife, isn't it? Just yes. to continue that legacy. It's just a beautiful thing. So guys, take notes. Um, I wanted to start off um, kind of off track here. I'm going to go on a rabbit trail before I do my teaching. Um, this is my favorite time of the week, being with you guys. Not just preaching, not because today I'm teaching or anything like that. This is my favorite time of the week, to be with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I wanted to uh, read a scripture to you. Um, let me find it here. I, I, I got, while we were praying, I got a, um, a word in my head, just kind of like I got a, an idea of like how Jesus must have felt when, what he meant by, like, these are my brothers and sisters. You know, when he says that to the people that were looking for him. Let me read the scripture to you. This thing is... Let me get this out here. Can't be having this in my face. All right. It says, uh, Matthew 12, 46. It says, while he was t uh, still talking, that's Jesus, to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mothers and my, my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. And I say, and I see that. You guys are my brothers and sisters. That's what he meant. Jesus said, this is our family. You know, obviously I have my biological family here. But this is our family. I see you guys as brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in the faith. And that's what, that's what Jesus was talking about. And you guys were talking about being woven together, interconnected, the cord. That's what a family, a family's strong when we're together, right? So that's that we're a family. 
And I felt like the Lord, again, this, and that's, that's a freebie right there. That was free. That was for free. So it has nothing to do really with the teaching. Um, and then um, I got out of Romans. I just want to speak this into the spiritual realm. This is Romans 8, my favorite place to, to kind of stay put. I'm sure a lot of you guys like Romans 8 too. It says, um, this is entitled, God's Everlasting Love. When then shall we say to those things, if God is for us, who can be against us? I declare this in the spiritual realm today. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, and also risen. Who is, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations, or distress, or persecutions, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, and in other versions it says, I am convinced. I am convinced. This is Paul saying, I'm convinced. You cannot persuade him. You cannot change his mind. Then neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. My teaching's done. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, Lord, I, I just pray, Father, for this word today. Lord God, I pray for your freedom, your liberty. I, just, I declare that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Lord God, that, that you do your work here today, Lord God, that you begin even now into our hearts. This truth that you showed me today, Lord God, and I humbly come here before you uh, to share your word, to share what you told me to tell, talk to people about today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I have, my title is Free to Forgive, Free to Forgive, and forgiveness is a foundation of Christianity. Free, uh, forgiveness is a fundamental foundation to Christianity. Isn't it good that we're forgiven? Amen. I'll say that again. Isn't it good that we are forgiven? Think about that. We are forgiven. It says that, all our, that our sin has been wiped clean by the blood of Jesus. That we are blameless and righteous in his sight. God wants you to know that even your most secret sin... Or embarrassing sin. You know that one that kind of pops up in your mind every once in a while. Maybe from your past. Something done recently. Something that snare that the enemy wants to have. Have authority over you and try to steal your joy. God has forgiven that sin. He no longer has you captured anymore. You're no longer bound by that. You don't need to be embarrassed anymore. Because it's forgiven. We are no longer bound by the enemy and his entanglements. Guilt, condemnation, regret have no hold on us in Jesus' name. You are free from guilt and shame. Your shortcomings, selfish, selfishness, carnality, the thing that you did in the past that was so horrible, God has forgiven you and has forgotten it. I want to read a few scriptures um, about God's forgiveness today to start off. And there's a couple components about forgiveness. There's, you know, us receiving forgiveness, completely receiving forgiveness, and also us going to other people to, to for, ask for forgiveness as well. Um, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, and this is New King James Version. That's where I like to camp out in the New King James. Hebrews 8, 12, it says, For I will be merciful to the unrighteous, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. It's an awesome promise. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So there's healing and forgiveness. Romans chapter 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's truly good news. That's the good news. I remember I used to work at a horror store and there would be a guy, an older guy would come in and say, what's the good news? And then I would say, well, Jesus Christ died for your sin. Uh, you, you can have forgiveness through him. And he was like, I'll just ask, you know, so I said, go to phrase I use. So, you know, that's but truly it is good news that we have forgiveness, that he remembers it no more. And that's total forgiveness. Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 14. Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 14. He has delivered us from the domain. And someone said, I think Paul has said something about this. Or putting on the armor of light, I think it was. Uh, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Transferred us to the kingdom, to another kingdom of his beloved son. Isaiah chapter 43, 25. I was watching you guys with the word, just speaking it forth in the spiritual realm over us right now. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You don't remember our sins. Isaiah chapter 1, 18. And I love this one. This is kind of funny. I, I, I never I, I read this one, obviously, several times. But I like, I like this version. It says, come now. Let us settle, settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And I like this. Come now, let us settle the matter. Let's settle this matter that you have, the problem that you have. What you're getting caught up in. It says, I, I said, I love this scripture. It is as if God is saying, okay, let us settle this once and for all. Your sins are forgiven. I don't remember your sins, so why are you remembering them? Why are you stuck on them? Why are you perseverating? Why are you letting the enemy keep you captive? Why are you letting, why are you going ruminating over them? Why are you keeping on them? He doesn't remember them. Why are you remembering them? Why are you bringing them back up to his face? God, do you remember that? No. Why are you continuing to remind him of something that he's already forgotten? Has already been forgiven. I am so thankful that God saved me and forgave me. That I have eternal life and have been freed so I can be used as an agent of love and forgiveness for others. God shows us through this example of forgiveness a way to live our lives. God, I love God. He, he ne he, he's not asking something of us that he hasn't done already. God has forgiven us. He did the heavy work already on the cross, right? He did all of the hard work for us. Now, he, in the, in the scripture, talks about us being imitators of God. We're supposed to be imitators of God. We are literally called to act, love, and yes, forgive like him. That's a tall order. If forgiveness is good enough for my God, then it certainly is good enough for me. If we are to be imitators of God, then we must, be act, we must act like him and we must be able to forgive like him. I want to talk about one example that kind of popped out in my mind. And all of us know the story of Joseph. I mean, talk about a tall order of forgiveness. Uh, just in case you don't know, I won't assume anything. So Joseph had brothers, many brothers. Son of Jacob, whole other story. Um, and his son, and the brothers were jealous. Nothing new, still, you know, can be today. His, yeah, you like that, Luke? So they can be jealous of one another. And they got so jealous of him and tired of him because he was, you know, Jacob's favorite, apparently, according to them. And they basically threw him in a pit, 
sold him into slavery. God, this is wonderful, right? Sold him into slavery, came back, faked his death to the father, lied to the father, said, your son was killed by a wild beast. He was abandoned. Joseph was abandoned completely, forsaken. Then he gets to Egypt, in prison. He's put in prison. And after all of that, he forgives his brothers. And I like the way, and I brought this story up, is because he forgives his brothers and ultimately sees that all of this awful stuff done to him was for the glory of God. Having that perspective when someone wrongs us. Something, those bad things that have happened to you. Has God used those things yet for you? I, th I know he's, for me, the things, that, the things that happen to you that we say are bad, and yes, they're bad, and, and maybe someone wronged us, but has God used that already for his glory? I know he has for me. That the, the hurts and the wounds have been able to allow me to minister to someone else, for example. Maybe someone in this church, you were able to talk to him and say, hey, I've been there, this is what happened to me. You were able to, to, to love on them. That's how God gets glory at the end of that. God gets the victory and, and your forgiveness, but he also gets the victory when you turn the thing that hurt you into a healing for someone else. And you receive also, and it's awesome too, because God heals you and get, heals you even deeper, I think, when you allow to walk yourself to walk through that wound. Allow yourself, like, hey, I'm going to walk through this, and God cleanses it even more and more and more. And you can walk in a, a, a bigger and bigger and bigger healing, a bigger and bigger victory in your life. Let me read here. Um, let me find. Let me find my home here. Just to, to, to I don't want to paraphrase Joseph because it was such a good and beautiful thing that he did. And the, and uh, let me see. Let me find my home. <clears throat> let me find it. Okay, here it is. This is in Genesis chapter 50, uh, verse 15. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. And it's entitled, Joseph Reassures His Brothers. <laughs> Remember, Joseph is second in command of Egypt now. He's in a place of power now. He's no longer a slave, hallelujah. He's no longer a victim. He's no longer a prisoner. God has already lifted him up, right? Now his brothers come to him and says, When Jesus' brothers saw their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us now and may actually repay us for all the evil work which we did to him. So they didn't really for receive the forgiveness. Do you see what I'm saying? Joseph offered them the forgiveness already. They kind of like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, okay. We were, but we got to watch our back still. Now dad's dead. Maybe he was just kind of being good because dad was around. He's second command of, you know, next, he's second next to Pharaoh. So they, this tells me right here that they didn't really accept, believe the forgiveness. But then God is always good, though. He, he takes it to another level for them. So they sent messages to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, both. Please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sins. They're asking, it's like us. God, can you forgive us for whatever, you know, I did. I know I did it 20 years ago. You know, I did this to my son or, or you know, this was a horrible thing I did. And, 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 you know, please forgive me. This is like that. Now, please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He wept. He's like, don't you know? I already dealt with this. I love you. I've forgiven you. That's God. Don't you know? Why? Why are you bringing this up again? Why are you bringing this up again? It breaks my heart. I forgave you already. I forgave you. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And, and, and another said, behold, we are your servants. God. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant, meant it for good, in order to bring it about 
as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. <laughs> so the, the ones that did him bad, right? Did him really wrong. Not only did he say, yeah, I forgive you, but kind of like stay away from me, stay out of my life kind of thing. No, he embraced them. He took care of them. My God, that's God's love. That's the picture. That's a perfect picture of what Jesus did for us and what he has for us. We aren't supposed to walk in condemnation and shame with our heads down. We are made righteous. We are made righteous. We are his sons and daughters, not servants. Yes, we are to serve the king. But we're his children. Amen. Let me read some. Another scripture to you guys. You know, like I said earlier, I am I am grateful for, you know, some of the tough things that happen in my life. Because if not, I don't think I would be here. I don't know, like, if some of the really horrible things that happened to me as a kid, I would not be here. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think I would have cried out to God. I don't think so. So those things that were horribly done to you, you know, I'm sorry that that happened, but maybe that made you cry out to God. Maybe that made you draw closer to Him right now. Maybe you're going through, th through something now. Just remember, crying before the Lord. Just get that intimacy with God, that, that, that just getting pulled into his presence. Without those horrible things, I don't think I would have felt like a need or realized that. So, you know, thank God for that. So this says Matthew, and I'd like to read the scripture, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's a promise, right? That's a condition, it sounds like there. A little bit in there, isn't it? Let me read that again. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And then that's a positive condition. And then this one's kind of like a negative condition to write the next verse after. It says, Matthew 6, 15. <laughs> but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So one sounds like kind of like a positive light if you think about it. If you hear it, listen. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But then he hits you from the, the, another angle in chapter uh, verse 16. It says, but if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. So if you're not going to go in the positive light, let me hit you from this other angle. You're not getting forgiveness. <laughs> Hopefully you get the point there. There's a spiritual principle here. God says, if you want to be forgiven, then you must forgive, period. Unforgiveness blocks the flow of God's presence in your life. It says in the scripture that your prayers can be hindered with unforgiveness. Spiritual principle. Exactly. Whatever that is, that's cool. First Peter, chapter 3, 8 through 10. Call to blessing. Again, it's 1 Peter chapter 3, 8 through 10. Finally, all of you be of one mind. Have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who love, for I'm sorry, for he who would love life. And see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Proverbs 17.9 says, and I love this. I just get a picture of this. Proverbs 17.9. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven. But dwelling on it separates close friends. I love that. Don't you want love to prosper in your life? You want love to prosper in your life. When a fault is forgiven, it says love will prosper in your life. Uh, uh, yes. And, and I wrote in here, have you lost a friend because of a disagreement? I'm just, I'm just speaking these things out because I want to pray with you at the end. I'm asking God, like, is there something, is there someone you need to forgive? 
or is there someone you need to go to and ask forgiveness from? So I'm just speaking this out. It says, have you lost a friend because of a disagreement? God wants to restore all relationships. He is in the restoration business. So I get the picture like Steve and I were working on my Ford, like restoring it, restoring. That's God. God loves restoring the stuff that's all broken. You know, picture like an old desk that's all ratty and then he restores it and fixes it up or something that's, something that looks like it's in disrepair or some junk. And then he restored it and it looks amazing. God is like, God loves that to do with people's lives. And forgiveness is a part of that. Luke chapter 6, 30, 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Then Peter came to Jesus. You know this one. Oh, man, this was a tough one. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seven, 77 times. So basically, if you're keeping track, I'm at 76, Lord. Then, then you probably weren't forgiving them for those 76 times. That's not forgiveness. <laughs> If you know, 77, okay, I'm, I, okay, this is it. This is the last chance. This is the last chance. Well, if you're there, then if you, if you remember how many times, that's not how God remembers. Remember, he forgets, okay? <laughs> um, uh, Luke chapter 7, uh, 47. Luke chapter 7, 47. I tell you, her sins... And they are many have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And again, I think we've all been forgiven much. So we are recalled to love much. Okay, and, I, and we know that story in that reference. Now, I kind of, um, I wanted to tell a, a personal story about my myself and a, and a story of forgiveness. But I had a little bit of, um, I was a little bit leery of doing it. Um, because I don't want to paint my father in a poor light. Uh, my father passed away about two years ago. I love him. And, uh, and at the end, near his end, he, he did make some, some improvements in his life. You know, he was an alcoholic and things like that. And he stopped a long time ago. He quit. Um, there was, there was some things that, you know, obviously he, he struggled with some things with mental illness and things like that. Um, but I know he no longer struggles. You know, he's with the Lord. I did pray with him, and uh, he's no longer bound to these things. But I say these things not to paint my dad in a bad light, but I want to give God glory for it. If that, and uh, let me preface that before I talk. I want God to get the glory, and I want to give an example maybe you can connect with. So that's kind of like why I'm going to share this testimony. Um, so. When I was uh, younger, my parents uh, divorced, and um, after I was probably about I don't know like seven, eight, nine. I can't remember. You know, pretty young. But after that, my my dad for um, from from one for one reason or the other, I think because since his marriage was destroyed, I felt like he kind of got something twisted in him, where he destroyed other marriages, um, and he dated only women that were married. So he, he so the, the women that he da he he dated were married women, um, and um, unfortunately that's not a I mean obviously that's a sin, and obviously a very d dangerous proposition uh, to date married to date married women. Um, so I, I think I was probably about twelve years old, and I was remember I remember being upstairs, um, in my bedroom, and my dad was downstairs with. His girlfriend, AKA, also married. Um, and uh, I remember all of a sudden a guy's voice screaming, yelling in the house. And unfortunately, it was the, the woman's husband. And I was, like I said, I was pretty young. I can't remember exactly how young I was, but young enough. And, uh, and I thought, like the way he was yelling, I thought he had a gun. Like I thought he was, you know, you know, he was there. He was angry. And uh, so what I did immediately, I turned, I had a TV upstairs. I turned off the TV. I turned off my light. And I was like, just quiet upstairs. And uh, I just heard him like talking and talking. And really, honestly, to tell you the truth, I thought he had a weapon. 
and he was going to kill both of them. You know, he was just going to kill my uh, dad and his girlfriend. And I just remember I just wanted to be quiet so I would not be killed too. You know, I just self-preservation. And I remember picking up a, 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 a dumbbell, just waiting, you know, upstairs at the top of the steps. And I figured if they get him, and if, I didn't know if he knew I was up there or not. And uh, so, but just in case, if he came upstairs, I, would, I was going to kill him. Like, you know, I was going to hit him with the, a dumbbell. This is a kid thinking this. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, for, fortunately, that wasn't the case. And there was other instances where my dad put me in those situations where we went to the, the husband's house while he was away and we swam in their pool, his pool. And I was like, you know, so there's a lot of things. And I remember just being like, if something happened, like, why are, we, why are you putting me in these dangerous situations and threatening my life? Because obviously I'm you're swimming in the pool at, you know, your boyfriend, you know. That's at the house, you know. So I just remember all of those things happening. And um, that particular, going back, that particular night after, after she left, I found out the next day it was one of my dad's former girlfriends that heard that he was dating another woman, got jealous, and actually called the husband to let him know that he was at the house. So this was his second, at least the second one that he was on with a married a, you know, married woman. So she called, and then when my, and when my dad was on the phone, I literally picked up the phone, and I, this is before Christian, you know, a lot of blue language was coming out of my mouth that, as a young guy, just yelling at uh, this woman, you know, just totally, you know, venomous, you know, because she, she could have been killed because of what she did, you know, because of these games that they were playing, I was wrapped up in these games. Uh, threat, you know. And, you know, as time went by, you know, uh, I became a Christian when I was 17 years old. And uh, I remember one of the teachings Doug uh, uh, did was on forgiveness. And it just hit me that I needed to go home. God told me, you need to go home and ask your dad for forgiveness. And I was like, shouldn't it, shouldn't it be the other way around? <laughs> Should it be the other way around that I get him to? That's not happening. Like so, so I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. And my dad, I got home, um, I'm like 17, 18 years old, or whatever. And and I remember he was on the phone with the woman that called the other husband, and they were talking on the phone. And he was guess, going back and forth between the two. I don't know. So I I said to him, Dad, I want to. I want to ask you forgiveness for any time I've, you know, not listened to you or not been a good son in any way. And I remember it's, it, it throws him in his steps. Like he was on the phone. He's like, my son is asking me for forgiveness or asking you to forgive him. And I said it to, to him and to, for her at the, as much as I could at the time. And, and I think that it's weird. Like maybe it's weird to you go, well, why would you have to ask forgiveness? Well, the thing that God was showing me is this. Forgiveness isn't just to let them off the hook. It's not that. It's to let you off the hook. Okay? Do you guys catch what I'm saying? So when you forgive someone, you're freeing yourself. You're freeing yourself. So if there's somebody in your life you feel like you need to forgive... But you're like, they're not worth worth the forgiveness, or they've been hurting me so many times. It's it's part of your healing process. Yeah. It's a part of your healing process where you can offer forgiveness. Um, I always got this vision of God gave me this vision, or I might have heard it from I don't know, Larry House or some something. I'm sure a car with Bobby or who who knows where I caught this from, but when you hold on unforgiveness, it's like you're carrying that person on your back. So like whoever hurts you, you're carrying that person around on your back. You can't really function very well, right? I know I can barely get myself up sometimes, but literally having someone on my back or multiple people on my back, you really aren't functioning how God wants you to function. So by forgiving those people, you get freedom. You also extend freedom to them. And life to them too. So it's like both. 
And it allows God to work in their life too. Do you see? When you extend forgiveness, when really you feel like, oh, I wasn't the one that did it. You know? It brings life to those people. Now, let me be clear here, though. I just want to be clear about this. By no means am I saying that you stay in an abusive relationship. That's not what I'm saying. By no means are you to stay in an abusive relationship. A lot of the stuff that I was able to forgive my father and, and things like that was after I was out of that house. Okay? So you have to be safe. So I'm speaking to everybody here. If you're and those who are watching, I don't want you to think, oh, I must forgive them and go back to them and get abused again. I'm not saying that. So please hear me on that. Please hear me on that. That's not what I'm saying. Um, you must seek out under the counsel of God and the eldership of the church and reliable people you can walk through with, okay? This whole thing. This is not, you know, just you on your own. I was able to move in for six years and live with the houses and there was a lot of healing and modeling for me and safety and, and all those things. So I'm not saying go back to an abusive relationship and forgive and forget that kind of way. That's abusive. That's not what God wants. That, that's not that's not what I'm talking about. You might be thinking of someone who hurt you so bad, and I'm not, under, and, and I'm not under, underestimating this or devaluing what they did to you. So please, I'm not making light of what you don't know what happened to me, uh, Tim. Please don't think I'm devaluing that or underestimating how bad somebody hurts you. There are very heinous people out here in the world, hurt people that do horrible things to people. Okay? But what I am saying is forgiveness is part of the healing process. Don't be, you know, bound to the idea that you must go back and then be constantly, constantly abused. Because I remember I was caught in that trap at times, even 10 years ago, going back to my dad's house. How do I walk in that forgiveness when he's constantly hurting me? When that person's constantly letting me down? When I'm constantly tugging on the wounds, Okay. So please not, don't take that in the, the wrong way. You know, God will guide you through that whole process and under the protection of prayer with other people. That's not a journey on your own, you know. So just be careful with, you know, what you're hearing me say. Um, maybe you have a hard time right now forgiving that person. You might, God might be calling you to take a baby step and will to forgive them. You know, there's a thing that I heard like, God, I can't forgive them at this point, but I will to forgive them. Help change my heart. That might be a prayer for you today. Or whoever's watching, that might be a prayer. God, I will to forgive them. I'd like to uh, read a, a story from, for you. Um, it's uh, by Corey Ten Boom. You guys know, I don't know if anybody knows Corey Ten Boom. Um, so I wrote, I, I wrote, I, I, I kind of cut and paste this, uh, this short sharing here. It says, forgiveness is a struggle for all of us at one time or another in our lives. Perhaps one of the greatest stories of forgiveness is an experience Corey Ten Boone, author of The Hiding Place, had after she was released from the concentration camp. So this is the top, this is, uh, if you don't know Corey Ten Boone, she was basically, um, she wasn't Jewish, but she hit Jewish people and also disabled people. So my sister probably would like, you know, got the heart for the people that struggle. So she hid people from the Nazis, from the Germans at the time, because uh, the people with disability would also be executed. It wasn't just Jews. Um, so that, that uh, so she's famous for this. Uh, ultimately, she gets caught, though, for doing it. So let me read this to you. It says, it was in a church in Munich where I was speaking, to speaking in 1947 that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. One moment I saw the overcoat and the, and the, uh, the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visor cap with a skull and crossbones. Memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead, ahead of me, ripped sharp beneath the parchment of her skin. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in her home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp 
where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. I find message for a line. I, I, I can't help it, but I hear a line. You know, like, I don't know what it is. I find message for a line. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. So this is a guy, the former torturer, coming to her church and saying, I liked your message that you shared about forgiveness. Oh. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Rab Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there, but since that time you went on, I had become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Broiling. <laughs> Again, the hand came out, will you forgive me? <clears throat> and I stood there and could not. Betsy had died in that place, her sister. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been my sec many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed as hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I, for I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is an act of the will. Hear that? Forgiveness is an act of the will, and, th and then this is what she said, I like this. It says, but forgiveness is an act of, the, act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Regardless how your heart feels, Forgiveness is a choice and a will. Even though you don't forgive it, you step out and God's going to meet you there. That's what she's saying right here. <clears throat> Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raised down my arm, sprang into her joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Corey Ten Boom. Imagine being this man. So there's, there's an aspect I'm going into here. He participated in genocide, torture. He had to ask forgiveness. So God probably told him at some point, you need to go to one of your former victims and ask forgiveness. So we go, oh, Corey Ted Boone, that was amazing. She was forgiven, but she forgave. But my gosh, imagine being this guy, have, and God, he's a Christian now, and God told him, you need to go back to one of those people that you did that to and ask for forgiveness. And regardless of her answer, I want you to go back. That is gutsy. That's gutsy. You could say almost, oh, how callous it was for him to walk up to in church. But maybe he was being obedient to God at the time and for some healing and for healing for her ultimately, right? She got some healing out of that. He got some healing out of that. Don't hold back God's healing. Don't hold God's back healing, his healing for you. I believe God is telling me that there are people in this room, people that are watching, that you might have hurt somebody in the past. Perhaps you hurt someone in your past but never made it right. Or recently you treated someone poorly and haven't dealt with it. I'll say that again. Perhaps you did something in the past that you haven't made it right. You'd be led by the Holy Spirit by this, though. You know, I'm not telling you you have to go back to the guy, you know, whoever. You know, God guides you today on how you're going to handle that and how you're going to try to restore that. And also, have you treated some people crappy lately? At work, family, wife, husband, children. Don't be afraid to ask forgiveness for you, uh, uh, with your children. It's not weakness, it's strength. 
to be able to lower yourself and ask forgiveness to your kids. Let me, let's pray together. And I have a, a little bit more, but this is just the stages I feel like the Lord is doing this. Lord God, I just pray for the hearts of every single person in this room. Lord, I pray you call into remembrance, not to condemn, but to cleanse, to, to bring further healing, not to bring up a past sin for, uh, you know, for the enemy to, to uh, torture any of us or to have any uh, mastery or strength or, or anything. And, and probably, in fact, it, it, it already is there in some, fact if it's, in some facet if it hasn't been dealt with correctly. Well, God, if there's someone we need to ask forgiveness for, from. Well, God, I pray the Holy Spirit that you would show that. And regardless of their answer, we walk in your obedience. I ask, Father, in Jesus' name for that. If there's someone that we need to talk to. And I felt the Lord say to me that there's some here or who are watching this teaching have unforgiveness toward God. You're like, how can you have unforgiveness towards God? God is God. He's perfect. He didn't do anything wrong. Well, let me let me explain. You might, you might ask how we can have that unforgiveness. Maybe something devastating happened to you in your life. Or maybe you prayed and you felt God didn't do anything. God doesn't want you to have unforgiveness in your heart or bitterness towards him. He is not afraid of you being angry at him or being honest with him. He's not afraid of that. For you to be truthful. Hey God... This, I pray that this, that this thing happens still. Um, I have an issue with that. And let God begin to minister and work in your heart with that. And, and forgive him. Literally, you can forgive God. It's okay. It's okay. I've did this prayer before. It's okay. He's a big guy. He, he can handle it. He can ha handle your uh, tears, your anger. He can handle all those things. He would rather you be honest with him than you <laughs> pretend that you don't have it. There. He wants that out and he wants your freedom. He wants you to have freedom. God is if you're mad at God, tell him. If there's something in your heart about him, tell him. Tell him. Well, God, I just pray, Father, that you would just work in our hearts, Lord, that we would not be afraid to tell you how we really feel, because that's a real relationship anyway. Lord God, and I pray that you would just work that out in, in the hearts of, of my family here. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I felt like another part was, I want to take some time today for you to examine your own hearts. Do you have someone you need to forgive today? A mother, a father, sibling, coach, teacher, boss, coworker, friend, family member, or like I said, God himself. It's okay. Um, and it might be hard. And if you want prayer with that, Wayne and I will be up here to pray with you for that area. But Lord, I just want to pray right now with you guys. Lord God, I just... I'll lift up my brother's sister's hearts, Lord. They are so precious to you. They, you want them to be free. Free so they can love and, and be whole and complete and be able to do the things that you're calling them, that they can function the way that you created them. God, their hearts are so precious, Lord. The hearts of my brothers and sisters are so precious, Lord. You don't want them to be hung up in any way or partially hearts and broken hearts and wounded hearts. Lord God, I speak to those hearts in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you begin to soften them, Lord. Lord, that they would be able to forgive those that hurt them like you forgave them, Lord God. And I ask you to just begin to touch them, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Your love, Lord God, just flow over their hearts, Lord, your victory. Lord God, I just thank you for a new heart, Lord God. A new heart, new wineskins, Lord God. New life, Lord Jesus. And like I said, uh, I'm going to close with this, and we can keep playing, uh, Kevin, for a little bit. We'll stay in an attitude of prayer if anybody wants prayer right now. Wayne, what? You can come up here with me. If anybody would like prayer, or the ladies, or, anybody, or anyone can help walk around too. Uh, if you want prayer, just raise your hand. And it will come to you or you can come to us. But I do want to close this teaching. I love you guys. And I want you guys to walk in you the most freedom that you could possibly walk in. Amen. Amen.